Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no-holds-barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean Tobias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome you to the program today. Today we have Adam Knight, who is an expert on the Chinese economy and e-commerce. Welcome, Adam. Very much, Dean. Does any, anyone ever tell you you look like Ed Sheeran? Or is this Ed Sheeran? Uh, do you know what? I, I, I did used to get that quite a lot uh, back in the day, uh, in my, my, my early years. Um, uh, I, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah, it's a, it's a good compliment. You look like you're still in your early years, so that's another good compliment. So we're going to focus on reopening the economy today. It's on the minds of everyone around uh, the United States and other countries around the world as there's a slow, soft rolling going on. But specifically, what can we learn from China? So some interesting stats out of uh, what's going on. The economy has definitely turned back on in China. 99% of the businesses are open. 100% of the malls and shopping centers open. The hotels and airports are running at about 80% capacity, which is amazing. And the most important stat for those of you who are caffeine enthusiasts, um, Starbucks has now reopened 90% of their 4,200 stores in China. Revenge shopping, which uh, Adam will talk about, is uh, coming on strong there. One single Hermes store sold $2.7 million in merchandise in one day. And beauty salon transactions are up over seven times, which is uh, fascinating as well. We're going to talk about that on Friday with Cody. So if we look at some of the other data that we're seeing in China from our friends at McKinsey, we always look at consumer confidence data, which is more opt-in data, but it's it's t- very telling. And unlike some other countries around the world, the Chinese um, kind of recovery post COVID-19 optimism is really high. We're seeing that they um, are uh, much more optimistic than, than other countries. So we're going to talk about that as well. And then finally, on the um, consumer confidence front, we also look at household spending and what's going on there. So surprisingly, both in, uh, in all around China, you're seeing consumers that believe their income is actually going to increase and definitely their spending is going to be increasing as well. About average of about 30% is uh, on the trend up in those numbers. So interesting numbers coming out of uh, China. Adam, can you maybe uh, jump in here and give us some context but start out, first of all, is like, what is Tong? You're the CEO of a pretty big group that only focuses on China. And why did you focus or decide to focus your company only on China? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, one that I've been asked many, many times. Uh, I mean, I guess the short answer to that is why wouldn't we focus on China, right? It's a big enough country, a uh, huge retail market. And I think we'll get into some of the numbers a bit later on. But from an e-commerce and digital perspective, I don't think there's any market more exciting, more competitive, and therefore more in need of an agency that focuses on services that uh, help uh, businesses get into that market than China. Um, my own background was in, is in China, in Chinese studies. Um, I studied Chinese university that used to live out in Beijing, uh, based in London at the moment. Um, I'm one of the co-founders of the business. I've been going just over six years, and we, are, we describe ourselves as a social commerce agency. And what that means is that everything that we do sits at that kind of crucial intersection between uh, entertainment, uh, so social media, content, videos, influencer marketing, uh, and how that interacts with uh, uh, with e-commerce uh, predominantly. So we've been working with uh, dozens of brands um, over the years uh, to kind of get into China uh, and, and scale up there. Yes. Um, so I guess I know why you're in that market. I mean, so it's projected by 2021, it'll be the largest consumer market in the world, almost $6 trillion of spend going on there at that time, surpassing the United States. And e-commerce is about a $2 trillion business in terms of online. So tremendous opportunities there for for brands to come into the country. Um, but let's go back to some of the numbers that I rattled off. Give us your perspectives on, the, those numbers were very compelling. China is very different from other countries, um, especially free market economies and and such. But what can we learn from that, if anything? Yeah, absolutely. The the numbers that we're seeing coming out of China tell, um, on the whole, a pretty positive story in terms of this this, this bounce back um, off the back of uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, there are of course some discrepancies there, and, and you know it's not not a completely rosy picture. Um, but as you saw from the stats you just had on the screen here, we're seeing consumer confidence increasing by the day. Essentially, you know, these snapshot 
uh, uh, customer sentiment surveys have been done by McKinsey and a couple of other consultancies show that from week to week, that percentage increase uh, going up in terms of people that believe that the Chinese economy is going to be stronger uh, within a matter of months. Um, uh, I think this, this greater optimism is, is uh, you know, it, it's uplifting, but it's also translating into some very, very real numbers as well. Uh, again, there was a survey done by BCG uh, a couple of weeks ago now, right. which showed that, uh, 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 you know, uh, consumer spending in China uh, across uh, different product categories was uh, five times as great as in the US. And so I think China is set to be kind of a real engine of, of retail growth over the coming months. Yeah, you know, the data that we'll have in the uh, podcast summary will include the BCG data as well as uh, McKinsey and others. So um, compelling. Um, what are you seeing in terms of your brands and retailers that were marketing into China, maybe more store based? How, how are they getting back online quick? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a tough one. Um, I mean, it's now is a time to innovate. Now is a time to really think about um, priorities in China. Um, and what we've seen with the brands that we've been working with is some remarkable innovation uh, within the retail space. Um, it's a time where the pivot to digital has been um, even more pronounced than it would be during uh, uh, normal uh, working uh, uh, operations. Um, we've seen this kind of rise of so-called shop attainment, which is really kind of our sweet spot as an agency. So helping brands to think about uh, thinking about those connections between how uh, consumers consume content and how they consume products and, and the blurring between those two different worlds. Right. Uh, businesses have thought about you know entirely different business models and ways of, of getting product into consumers' hands that they are, you know in, in, in peacetime wouldn't necessarily have considered, but uh, under the circumstances are uh, kind of forced into those positions. Um, we've been working with brands right across the world actually as they as they think about this. You know from uh, retailers in New York who've been you know wondering how can we get product out of our stores, you know, physically sat in stores um, in Manhattan. How do we get that into consumers' hands? How can we list on e-commerce platforms? How can we drive away? We've been doing the same thing here in Europe, Paris, um, uh, Milan, London. Um, trying times, but a lot of opportunities as well, I think. Yeah, it's interesting that there's the data we're seeing um, on Revive through a lot of the uh, AI analytics and um, uh, selfie analysis is consumer usage is way up. Uh, investigating new products and services and recommendations of products and the shopping carts is up during the you know the big shutdowns around the world but at the same time you know you look at a country like China about 44 percent of their um, total commerce is online and in the United States big opportunity because only about 11 percent according to the latest study of total commerce is online some people will argue with that number that it's higher but if you look at the, the entire economy so we think at Reviv that the the whole pandemic and shutdown has totally changed the way people look and in terms of digital and even the baby boomer kind of laggard populations that weren't using digital as much are spiking big time. I mean, they're using Zoom for gosh sakes, <laughs> something they never heard of. But um, we think it's a massive opportunity in the States that Omnichannel is finally coming online and uh, maybe even catch up with China. I think we could get up to the same online percentages of shopping, which is good for retailers and brands. Yeah, potentially. I think it's, um, I mean, China, as you kind of pointed out, China really is the world leader when it comes to online shopping. Uh, they've, they've got it down to a T. And there are a couple of kind of structural reasons for that. And, you know, uh, the, the development of the kind of digital economy there has has supercharged um, uh, wider economic growth over the last um, uh, decade, at least. Um, uh, but, you know, during this crisis, um, you know, a lot of brands that, you know, even in China, uh, were kind of slightly hesitant about jumping full force into the digital opportunity, have started to rethink the way that they do things. Um, some really big names, you know, Louis Vuitton, for example. This is, you know, in Prada. These are big international luxury brands uh, right. that usually would turn their noses up at the idea of stream or working with influencers and bloggers. Um, but they've just been forced into that corner, whether they like it or not, and face, to face up to the reality that this is just how shopping is going to be done. And so we moved to their very first live stream um, on a platform called Little Red Book just a few weeks ago. Massive success, uh, significant revenue driven from it. Prada, same thing. They work with influencers for the first time in China, uh, a rapper of all people, uh, to help promote some of their products. Um, Absolutely. 
So the, um, and you know, I think it's about a $60 billion market for beauty products over there as well. So there's lots of room for the big brands that you've mentioned, as well as the indie brands. We've had a few indie brands uh, on the Reboot Chronicles, kind of give them a shout to, uh, you know, kind of reach the, reach the market. How do you help them get into China? Um, so for instance, is, is, is Tmall kind of your biggest uh, avenue or are there other creative things they can do? And then then we'll follow up and talk about some lessons. What can we learn here about opening up uh, stores and things? Absolutely. Uh, beauty is a massive category in China. Um, it's a uh, yeah, huge, huge industry. Uh, a lot of competition, uh, increasingly um, not just from foreign brands like Western brands, but also a lot of K-beauty from Korea, J-beauty from Japan, and a lot of domestic players these days as well. You know, high quality products at low price. Um, right. Getting to the market is very competitive, but at the same time, it's never been simpler from a kind of barrier to entry perspective. Um, uh, it's interesting when you look at Chinese e-commerce, um, the way that people shop, um, certainly here in Europe, uh, and I dare say for the US as well, yes, we have big platforms like sort of Amazon uh, and what have you, uh, but actually a lot of consumers here, and a new person, you know, if I want to buy a product from a brand, I tend to go to that website and I'll buy it from that website. Um, uh, and so, but in China, it's kind of the, the, the inverse. Um, most e-commerce is only done through big platforms like Tmall that you mentioned. So Tmall has about a 55, 60% market share of uh, B2C uh, e-commerce in China. By far and away the biggest player and one, one of the many platforms that we uh, with to help brands get into the market. However, on Tmall, yes, you get the big numbers. You get the hundreds of millions of monthly active users. Um, but it's an increasingly difficult space to not only get listed on in the first place, but also to be seen and actually gain any traction. So for the kind of indie brands that you were mentioning, actually um, there are a whole number of much more niche, much more targeted, a much lower barrier to entry platforms that brands should be thinking about. Particularly within the beauty space, there's one platform I just mentioned a minute ago called Little Red Book, right. which is a kind of like, I guess you can think of it as a kind of uh, a, a, an amalgam of, um, uh, of Instagram meets Pinterest meets Amazon. So Instagram in the style of content, the influencer driven, uh, very image heavy. Pinterest in that you kind of gather together different as Amazon in its transaction. And this has become the go-to platform for beauty and fashion brands in particular, predominantly because of its demographic. It's 88% female, uh, it's about 60% wealthy so tier one cities beijing shanghai so on and so forth um uh, and it's about 60 70 percent under the age of 30. so basically you want young wealthy women it's the platform to go to that's an amazing one what we've noticed in some of the um, early data during the uh, shutdown is as people are moving to online and, and trying out new products and services in beauty and other categories that they're actually switching brands they're switching brands they're switching retailers retailers has something to do with What's open essentially in the states because there's a lot of uh, you know pickup services going on and some uh, some stores like you know Walgreens and CVS and Walmart and Target are allowed to stay open, but we're seeing a lot of switching going online. They've had time to explore. They've had time to take selfies and do a lot of skin analysis, for instance. Um, so let's just talk about that. I think that's an opportunity in the states for all types of brands to gain to gain share. What's what's loyalty like with the um, the Chinese shopper are they very fickle? Because we're we're seeing that now happening in the states. Absolutely. I mean, it's um, it's it's a really interesting question because if you look at comparative surveys, um, the Chinese consumer has always been much less sticky, much less loyal than their international uh, um, right. you know, colleagues. Um, and I think there are, I mean, there are a few different reasons for that. Um, it's partly just because you haven't got the decades and decades of consumerism that have, you know that, that our economies are built on here. Um, outside of China. Um, and I think it's also um, a kind of, um, without getting too kind of uh, culturally deterministic here, it's, it's also, a, there's, there's, a, there's something about authority as well. There's a kind of an innate sense, particularly among younger Chinese consumers, that um, I don't necessarily want to just do what I'm told and what I'm kind of spoon fed from an advertising perspective, but I really do take the time to explore, to sort of seek out those multiple touch points and to educate myself about the brands that I'm interested in. So what you see is that is a, is a very distinct generational divide. Uh, younger consumers, the so-called uh, 80, or after 80, they're called in, in Chinese, or after 90, so those born in the 80s or 90s, 
um, who uh, are, they, they need more marketing touch points. Um, so yep. omni-channel strategy is what's required. Um, and they're much more fickle when it comes to choosing brands uh, and switching between them uh, at different stages. And you see that by generation uh, decreasing as you, as you move up the kind of uh, age demographic. And if you look at some of that data, it was almost too optimistic, but that's why I thought I'd open up the you know, episode with that. So in many countries, there's not guaranteed employment. So in Europe and in the UK and the States, you know, the confidence level about, hey, I think my income's rising. I'm, I think I'm going to spend more. I'm not sure we're going to see that. Um, very different. Uh, so what, what are some good lessons that we can see from China? Knowing that few of them are probably not as... Uh, relevant in a controlled economy, so to speak. It's a good point, and uh, uh, you know, I think the, the numbers that we that we've been talking about are, are do tend to paint quite a rosy picture. And there are, of course, a lot of there's a lot of heartache in China as well. Uh, there's pretty some pretty bleak examples of brands that are not doing great. Especially um, if you zero in on certain provinces, that data was globally for the whole country. Yeah, absolutely. In Hubei province, which is where where all this kicked off, um, right. has been hit hit very hard. Um, and there are individual brands. I mean, H and M. They just released their results uh, last week or the week before for Q1 in China, and uh, they were down 79%. Uh, it, was a, it was a rough, rough time, um, and that's despite the fact that 90% of their stores have reopened, um, but their sales are tanking. Um, so, um, you know, in terms of you know what lessons can we draw here? I think, um, as I said at the beginning, I think they're certainly in real time for for brands to think about. Um, what really defines them, um, uh, you know, and how is it that they're delivering uh, their product or their service into the hands of consumers? And we've seen some great innovation here. You know, brands that have switched from uh, wholesale distribution models to direct consumer models through uh, digital right. commerce. So, uh, Taobao, another platform owned by Alibaba, um, uh, actually their first uh, kind of B two C and, and C two C e commerce platform. Um, they launched, uh, they could really been driving their live stream function. And what we've seen is a lot of um, uh, agricultural uh, producers um, basically saying, well, there's no market for our products now in hotels and restaurants. Um, right. so what we're going to do is start selling direct to consumers. So you've got all of these kind of rural dwellers um, who are picking up their smartphones um, and live streaming for the first time and selling their products in small, you know, kilo or two kilo packages and shipping them into the city. Uh, and that's been a remarkable phenomenon. We've seen, just here in the UK, I've seen a few companies starting to experiment with some uh, fishermen off the south coast who've been selling products into, uh, you know, I've, I've had fish delivered to my flat here and fresh the boat from you know, a couple of hundred kilometers away uh, uh, you know, through live streaming as well. So there's, you know, you do start to see this seeping out into the wider world. Um, but I think digital technology has got to be at the heart of it, right? Um, I think the other thing that we have to kind of bear in mind is that as we see in China, and as is definitely going to be the case outside of China as well, once we start getting back to some form of normality, I think the emphasis is on some form of normality. We're not going to go jump straight back into normal lives um, uh, immediately. And what you've seen in China are a number of uh, ways that um, kind of social distancing measures have been reduced and the economy's gone back to normal. Um, that, you know, are not, it's not business as usual. Things like um, food delivery services, for example, in China, where um, as your uh, Uber Eats or your Deliveroo rider is on its way, um, right. see a little icon floating above their head that tells you what their body temperature is so that you can check them. They've not got, you know, not got the flu, not got coronavirus. Um, so all sorts of kind of little instances of innovation as we kind of adapt to this this new normal because I think there really is no going back to how things were before. And the businesses will survive the other ones that will be able to pivot and adapt within that. Exactly. That's why I mentioned kind of controlled economy. Um, so in certain certain people that I know and you know in China, you know, they can't leave their let's just call it their complex. So it usually has a guard gate on it until they, they have a mask on, they've been temperature checked. And the same thing on the ingress when they're trying to get into a mall or their, quite frankly, their office building. I don't know if we're going to see those types of controls in many countries around the world. It's just improbable to do that. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, uh, with face masks, there's, there's, a, there's a, a much more ingrained culture of, of wearing them. Uh, out in not only China but East Asia more, more generally. Uh, arguably, that has you know, was a factor in containing the coronavirus in the first place. 
um, uh, there have been some quite strict measures um, going on in China. Um, some warranted um, and necessary, and I think many countries would do well to observe and, and, and mimic. Uh, some not so much. Um, some pretty awful cases, uh, particularly in the south of China, where there's a large um, uh, African community, uh, African migrants working in, in Guangzhou in particular. A lot of pretty nasty cases of, 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 of racism and xenophobia as um, not just African migrants, but the American migrants as well have been uh, uh, forced out of their homes, uh, forced onto the streets. Um, uh, signs up in McDonald's restaurants saying, you know, no black people. Um, you know, pretty awful, I mean, not very awful stuff. Um, uh, and so the, the measures that the Chinese government and some Chinese businesses have taken have um, varied in terms of uh, efficacy and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, whether they were really needed in the first place. Yeah, the word draconian comes to mind. Um, you have people over there. How, how are you doing business right now? Yeah. Or, or maybe not right now, but, you know, weeks ago. It's, um, again, it's, it, we, we, we've been adjusting. Um, uh, you know, I think it's, we were, we were quick to allow people to work from home um, before we were kind of mandated to do so. Um, uh, that took some getting used to, but we use a variety of, you know, we use the same tools that everybody uses and that, that was easy enough and we're a service provider, so we didn't need to physically all be in one place. I think the, the most, um, difficult, but also the most important thing over the last few months as we've been working through this, both in China and, and now here as well, um, has been, uh, maintaining a sense of kind of cohesion, uh, whilst not physically being in the same place and, and keeping an eye out for people's mental health as well. Um, particularly when we have, um, say, Chinese nationals that are working with us here. Um, you know, these are people who are thousands of miles away from home. They've got no support network here other than their colleagues and, and, and you know, friends in the office uh, who are suddenly kind of you know, isolated. And it's, it's tough um, to be away from, from family in particular, um, especially when, and this is something we've dealt with quite a lot, um, uh, family members have been calling up uh, Chinese uh, team members uh, here mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, asking them to return home because the uh, uh, because the, the, the news in China is, is painting such a bleak picture of the of the coronavirus response here in, in with, you know, when put in comparison with how China dealt with it. Again, not totally unfair, um, but um, there is certainly a slightly propagandistic uh, element to it as well. Right. You mentioned a kind of a rush to online. What uh, Reviv has been seeing is a lot of the brands and retailers who were evaluating uh, rolling out uh, selfie technology, actually accelerating that quickly, coming back and saying, how do we get this up sooner into the summer rather than the, the methodical fall launches and obviously moving more to online than in-store, knowing that the in-store will, at least in this country, uh, come on slower, we think, than definitely China. Uh, China did. Are you seeing a big rush to uh, to digital. Absolutely. I'm using the word digital is kind of um, old, but it's amazing how many are still, the percentage of the revenues um, still are lagging in terms of in-store versus digital. What we've seen is um, similar to that, not so much a rush to digital given that I think most of the businesses we're dealing with are already pretty invested there, but a lot of, um, even within the digital space, a kind of rush towards um, you know, quick and easy wins essentially. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody's hurting. You know, retail sales here have just evaporated overnight. Everyone's looking for quick fix ways of getting product into people's hands. Um, and the, basically every conversation I've had over the last couple of weeks with, with retailers has been around, okay, in peacetime, um, you know, this is maybe not the approach we would have taken. We would have wanted to do more due diligence. We would have wanted to make uh, make it more integrated. We want to make it a bit more slick, but we're not in peacetime anymore. And, you know, tough times call for, for tough measures and you know actually what we're looking for are how can we like i said get products to people's time quickly effectively cheaply scale things up test the water uh and, and keep agile essentially so um that's very much at the forefront of people's minds at the moment something we're working quite hard to help people um let's figure out yeah i bet the um in terms of the uk um market itself the um how do you think the confidence level is there kind of bringing stores back online in the States, uh, state by state, uh, they're starting to open up the economy. Yeah. Some mayors do not agree with the governors, a lot of fighting going on. It's normal stuff in a democracy, but, uh, what's the plan over there? 
Yeah, I think there's, a, there's, there's, there's definitely an element of the unknown in the UK at the moment. The government's been quite tight-lipped about their so-called exit strategy. There's been quite a lot of pressure coming from opposition parties and from the media to for the government to open up that conversation a little bit more, but so far they've resisted. Um, so at the moment, we actually just have no idea uh, what the plan is. Um, we've got this kind of rolling lockdown where every three weeks the government announces whether they're going to extend it or whether you know what measures they're going to take. That expires, I think, next week, at the end of next week. Um, so we should have some more clarity by then. Uh, I think the idea is that, um, just as I was just you know, describing just before, you know, it's not going to be, it's not black and white. We're not going to switch from lockdown to not lockdown. There's going to be some form of social distancing until at least the end of this calendar year. And what that means from a retail perspective is, is, of course, that you need to start keeping, you know, start bearing this in mind. You know, if you work in hospitality, or a restaurant, I mean, that's, this is catastrophic. I mean, if you have to suddenly space all of your tables six feet apart, right. and you're, you, know, you go down to you know, 50% capacity or 30% capacity, that's just a business model that doesn't work anymore. Um, from a retail perspective, it's things like, again, copying what's going on in China, things like bring your own devices. You know, if you're going into a McDonald's and you have one of these digital screens where you order, who wants to touch that now, right? You, you exactly. Need some kind of native app where people can download that, they can plug it in on, on their own phone without having to touch anything. And that contactless retail is something that has been developing in China for a little while now, uh, was accelerated by this whole crisis. And I think a lot of brands now here are going to start uh, copying some of the technology that's being used over there. We are seeing that in store. Um behavior around the world. We know as they come back into the stores that there's going to be a whole new focus on safety and hygiene. And uh, so use your own device. UIOD is, is huge. And um, with like selfie technology and analytics and what uh, Revive powers, they're very agnostic. They'll do, you know, a touch screen, a mirror. Um, but what the trend has been before this was, I just want to use my own device. I feel more comfortable with it. I can take it home and actually keep using it and have a relationship with the retailer because I'm using it and sending them information. Um, we think that's going to just accelerate big time. People are going to be, at least for the next year, not wanting to touch everything in the store anymore. And a lot of, um, a lot of, a lot of as you would say, wartime economic plans to still work out. It's like you can still run a, a shop or a store, but the the overall p l is going to be just reshaped, but the consumer is um, going to drive a lot of you know what I'm willing to do, what I'm not willing to do, and that's um, I think we're in agreement there that that's why the old word uh, of called you know omni-channel is going to continue to spiral up. And omni-channel versus just e-commerce is important because it's like when I come into a store and I go back and I'm at home, I, I still have a relationship with this brand or this. Um, this retailer probably not as much in China. I know that there it's it's heavy, heavy, heavy online, or they like to shop. But in the states, we think there's going to be more blending going on, probably in Europe too. Absolutely, and I think another thing is that you'll start to see again, similar to what we've had in China for a few years now, is this kind of platformization. You know, who wants to if you if you're walking down the high street, um, who wants to download an app for every single retailer along there? Um, exactly. You know, you actually what you want is one app. Uh, that you know, each of those retailers has a space within. Uh, of course, you see that in China with the likes of WeChat, which is, I mean, really is one app to rule them all. You can all singing, all dancing, literally everything uh, on one application. Um, Fifty percent of all time on smartphones is done just on one app, just on WeChat. It's crazy. Um, uh, and I think you know, it's the stuff of dreams for the likes of Facebook, and they have tried to copy innumerable functions from WeChat, uh, some more successfully than others. Um, right. and the, the, the retail, you know, the, the company, the, the, the tech company that can, that can nail that, uh, I think is gonna, is gonna do well for themselves. And I think some, uh, some brands and retailers would argue with your, your statement there. You know, you look at someone like an Alta Beauty, there's mm -hmm. such a loyal audience there. They want to, they want to use the app. They want to use it when they're, they're, they're not in the stores and, uh, use that as a connection back to the, uh, the kind of in-person high touch, um, model that they have. Um. So really, Adam, we really appreciate having you on the uh, the uh, episode here. Any uh, concluding thoughts for uh, our audience? Um, I guess it's a uh, yeah. I think from a kind of slightly, I guess from a kind of motivational perspective, I think um, you know last time around this this happened. Uh, you know, two thousand three SARS. Um, there were two Chinese retailers, relatively unknown at the time. Um, one was called Alibaba. One was called JD Jingdong. Right. 
And yep. at the time, Alibaba was just a you know, B2B wholesaler. Um, uh, JD didn't even have a website. They were just, they were a physical retailer. Uh, and they used that opportunity to really kind of fundamentally change what they, you know, what they did as a business. Alibaba launched Taobao, JD launched JD.com. Uh, and now those two companies are the third and fourth largest internet companies in the world behind Amazon and Google. Um, you know, and it was a direct result of the innovations they took during that, of those times of adversity. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly cheesy message. Um, and obviously not everybody can replicate to that scale, but I think there's something there. I think that businesses that, um, uh, that can really make use of this opportunity are the ones that, uh, that are going to thrive over the years to come. Yep, have to agree with you there. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, join us again on Friday. We're going to have Cody on, the $9 billion uh, um, brand that is going to talk to us a little bit about how they've been helping their partners through the crisis and their plans to reopen the economy as it rolls around the world, specifically in professional services business. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate you coming on. All right. Bye, guys. Cheers. Cheers.